Students, employees, and members of the Hastings community to this truly special event. This is the first of two invited faculty lectures this academic year. The invited faculty lecture is one of the highest honors a faculty member can receive at Hastings College. Today I have the privilege of introducing a remarkable friend who has not only mastered the art, the art of glass blowing, but has also left an incredible mark on the world and its people. <clears throat> Dr. Brian Core, a 1990 a 1999 graduate of Hastings College, is currently a professor of art specializing in glass. He also serves as the department chair for the visual, of visual arts. His journey extends far beyond our campus, having amassed over 27 years of glass blowing expertise. Brian's work adorns public and private collections worldwide, including the prestigious institutions like the National Gallery of Australia, the Art Gallery of Western Australia, and the Toledo Museum of Art. His passion for the craft has transcended borders as he's not only taught at renowned institutions like the Corning Museum of Glass in New York, the Pilchunk Glass School in Seattle, Washington, and Nam Seoul University in South Korea, but he has also served as an associate professor at the esteemed Toyama City Institute of Glass Art in Toyama, Japan. Beyond his accolades and achievements, Brian Kaur is a man of many facets. He is a loving father, a devoted husband, a writer, an archer, an avid surfer, a weightlifter, a novice guitarist, and a world traveler. His adventurous spirit doesn't stop there. He's tackled various 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, and even a few Spartan races, demonstrating his commitment to pushing the boundaries. What truly sets Brian apart is his unique ability to connect with people. He's not just an educator, he's a mentor who inspires and instills beliefs in his students, his close friends, and his colleagues. His genuine passion for art creativity serves as a bridge to hearts and minds of those he encounters. Today we gather not just to hear a lecture, but to embark on a journey of discovery with a man who embodies the spirit of continual growth and exploration. It is my distinct honor and privilege to present our colleague, your professor, and my dear friend, Dr. Brian Kaur, who will be sharing his wisdom in his invited faculty lecture titled, Continually Becoming. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage with the warmest applause. All right. Uh, thank you all very much for being here today. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, this is not something I would ever volunteer to do, but I, <laughs> I, I really do appreciate, especially the students who, who thought I would have something interesting to say. Um, when I was thinking about what to talk about, you know, I thought about doing a traditional artist lecture. Um, I thought about talking about Japanese architecture for an hour, and I thought all those things would be a little bit, a little bit boring for you. So. Um, I decided to just share dimensions of my own story with you, um, not necessarily because I think I'm this like super interesting person, um, but because I'm hoping that hearing um, sort of honestly and candidly about some of the experiences that I've had um, will be helpful to you, especially to the students. Um, so today I'll be sharing some insights um, to various points um, in the journey along my path. Um, especially focusing on sort of that trajectory from a young man um, who would have been characterized as an at-risk student throughout high school and part of my time at Hastings College um, to a faculty member, professional artist, citizen of two countries, um, husband and father. So Casey did a great job introducing me so I don't need to, to do that part. Um, so I'll also be talking about the 15 years that we spent living overseas. So um, some of the biggest lessons I've, I've learned in my life came from that time period, um, and I'm incredibly thankful to have had all those experiences. I'll also be showing some, uh, a few select artworks um, with one particular story that I'd really like to share with you. So um, I grew up in Denver, Colorado. I had a really kind of awesome early childhood. I sometimes feel like my, my life kind of peaked at the age of four. You know, like things were great um, until I had to start going to school. So I've, as you'll hear, I've always had this kind of love-hate relationship with school, which is ironic given what I do now. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really great. And I, I felt like I was deeply creative in the way that, that kind of all kids are and a lot of adults forget to be. Um, and I went to 12 years of Catholic school. That was, that was, uh, that kind of did a number on me. Um, and I realized, you know, now looking back at it, that my educational experiences were, were so much more narrow than what you all get to, to be exposed to today. 
Um, so I'm really thankful that that's evolved for you and that you get to experience something different. Um, I was still really into drawing and stuff when I was a kid, but starting kind of fifth and sixth grade, I got in trouble with the teachers for like wasting time in class drawing so many times. Um, they didn't even call my parents in to talk about it, that I was just like, I'm, I'm done. And I literally stopped drawing the day I had parent-teacher conference and didn't pick up a pencil to draw again for like 10 years or something like that. Um, but despite all this, like I excelled in school and I, I really love to learn. Um, moving into high school, it's kind of an interesting transition. So I had this really rapid decline in academic performance. Um, and it's something that I still think about and don't fully understand. Um, it did coincide really directly, I've only realized this recently, um, but with a pretty substantial concussion that I received. Um, I also was diagnosed, once I was having a really hard time in school, um, and there were no resources in my school, we kind of sought outside testing, and I was, you know, diagnosed with some learning disabilities and stuff like that. But this was like the 90s, and so people didn't really understand that connection between, you know, concussions and like, like how you learn and think, how your mind works, and then, you know, the idea of, of different learning styles was just not part of that conversation at the time, at least in the schools that I was attending. Um, so I was, I was sort of deemed this like problem student and kind of shuffled to the side. So I, was, I went to a high school where, you know, either you're like getting channeled into this like kind of Ivy League, top tier university thing or you're gonna go play like D1 football somewhere. And I kind of fell in between those two spots. Um, so for, for me, you know, I, our, our vice principal even told my parents like, he should probably do something besides go to college. Um, and if I'd listen, uh, she probably had decent intentions in saying that, but if I'd listened to her, I obviously wouldn't be here right now. So um, luckily I'm persistent. So. I, I literally narrowly graduated from, uh, from high school. Um, and when it came time to do something after school, I, I did have some pretty limited choices because of my academic performance. I also had, at that point, a very limited um, level of interest in continuing my education because school had just been so challenging for me. Um, luckily, I went to a, uh, a college fair and ran into some representatives. I think it was Mike Karloff from Hastings College and he kind of talked to me for a while and I realized that I had the chance to, to maybe go to a school and we, I visited and um, that's another story but um, they really graciously offered me a baseball scholarship and then a, a super generous academic scholarship which I was a little bit floored um, to receive but that, that made college viable for me. Um, at the same time I also, my, my circle of friends in Denver was becoming kind of increasingly involved with uh, some pretty serious levels of crime and they were starting to be impacted by violence. Um, and my first year at Hastings College, I lost two friends um, to, to violence. So, you know, there, there kind of came a point at which I needed to, in order to have a future, I needed to leave Denver. So, so I moved to Nebraska. Um, and I, I experienced, it's my first experience of culture shock and it's still to this day with all the different places we've lived, it's the most severe culture shock I've ever experienced. <laughs> um, so I mean, I'd grown up in the mountains, you know, they were always this kind of like presence and growing up in Denver, I had this really diverse group of friends. Um, I lived in a big city and I really loved that and I suddenly moved out into the middle of nowhere and it was like, so much sky and I felt super exposed and like all this corn and cows and stuff and like this really kind of like monochromatic small midwestern town. Um, so I, I was really kind of struggling with making that adaptation and immediately like college level courses were kind of competing with newfound freedom. Um, having gone to 12 years of, of Catholic school I kind of let it rip as soon as I got here. Um, <laughs> That was just what I needed to do, I guess. And, and I did come here to play baseball, and I was on the baseball team when I first came here. Um, you know, but I'd, I'd had a string of really rough experiences with being coached and competing for positions. So there was a point in time, I think it was a month in, where I was just like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm done. Um, this isn't fun anymore. But baseball, for me, even through all those academic struggles and stuff, had been like my constant. Um, and I think it's, it's that for a lot of people, like baseball is this constant, it's this cyclical thing that always comes back to you every year. And for me, without that anchor, it was like I was really cut adrift. Um, 
So I began this pretty rapid downward spiral um, with my recreational outlets becoming like really problematic. Um, in hindsight, I, I realized a few things. Um, I was really struggling to adapt and I didn't have the skills or the tools to do that um, in the way that I would now, obviously. Um, I was trying to build relationships and I just did that the best way that I knew how. Um, I was facing some really significant learning challenges and I just didn't know how to ask for help. And the help that was in place here, there was something, but it, it wasn't a lot. Um, you kind of had to go down into the basement and be this like knucklehead that was like going into the basement to get help and I just wasn't, wasn't really into that. So, um, you know, and I also didn't understand anything that I know now about like the importance of exercise and sleep and like eating good food. So I was really heavily self-medicating to like manage all this stuff, you know, just to try and keep myself together. I, th I think through that I was kind of seeking relief and I was also seeking a deeper meaning that life as it was in the classroom just wasn't offering me. Um, so during this time though, and this was, you know, obviously a pretty dark time for me, um, this lifeline came from a really unexpected place. So I, I came here as a communications major. I'd taken some kind of test that had told me I'd be good at communication. So for a minute I was like, I'll be a weatherman, like that'll be great. You know, I'll do something like, if you can imagine me being a weatherman, that's supposed to be blank, yeah. This is the dark time of my life, dude. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so I had to take one art elective as, you know, as part of my curriculum. Um, and I was like, I'll take ceramics and no offense, Jerome, but I was like, it'll be easy. I'll just take ceramics and get it done. It turns out that years later when I did have to take ceramics, Jerome gave me a very gracious D because I would rather be in the hot shop than in the ceramics studio. Um, but I was essentially forced to take glass blowing. Um, so you know, my advisor came to me and was like, well, you know, ceramics is full, um, there's a glass blowing class, you could take that. And I had a friend whose sister had taken it and I'd been to her apartment and seen all these crazy glass things and stuff. And I was like, well, sure, like whatever, I'll give it a shot. I'll just like tick that box. And this is one of those things. So for me as, as a, former, uh, a former Catholic and I'm generally skeptical of uh, cosmic intervention and a benevolent higher power, um, I, my mouse is not working. Whoops, sorry. It's one of those things where like the odds of, of me actually becoming a glass blower were so slim, it's really hard to explain that in any other way. I went to this super random school in the middle of nowhere, kind of by chance, had to take an art class, couldn't take the one I wanted to take, had to take this glass blowing class, and suddenly it was like, whoa. So I came into class the first day, um, late as I typically was, and my teacher was doing this demonstration and um, you know, I walked in, he had this huge gather glass on the pipe and, and it was this kind of, it was this like glowing material that was giving off its own light and there was like music and machinery and fire everywhere and I just, I'd never seen a learning space that, that looked like that. Um, so it was this totally foreign space to me but it was also like instantly riveting. You know, at that time I didn't really, I didn't find a lot of the classrooms engaging and the second that I walked in there it was like, oh, this is, this is really interesting. I don't know what this is, but I need to, to kind of spend more time here. Um, so it was, it was both foreign, but it was also really familiar to me in that, you know, there's this like, there's a real element of teamwork to it. There's a physicality to it. It was kind of like suddenly playing a sport again, except there is this whole different purpose to it. Um, so it, it brought a whole range of really great things into my life. So it brought a degree of difficulty and challenge that I really loved. So that is me with hair. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so it was a way for me, I, I could focus in the glass studio unlike I could in any other classroom. And I could focus for really long periods of time. You know, I'd find myself in a standard classroom kind of checking out mentally after 20 minutes or so. And in the studio, I can stay engaged for hours. Um, and for those of you who have been in there, you know that it's this really kind of like loud, chaotic space. For me, I found silence amidst all that chaos um, and, and real peace for the first time in a long time. I also, with art making, I found a new way of communicating, um, you know, complex ideas, complex emotions, things that, that language and even written language just didn't really do for me. So it brought all these things into my life that were suddenly really enriching. Um, 
So there followed this kind of brief period of, of almost like leading a double life and these, these, this tension between kind of who I'd been and who I was becoming. So I was really falling in love with glass and dedicating more and more time to it. Um, but you know, I was still involved with, with alcohol and drugs to a really dangerous degree. Um, and I felt like I was involved in this kind of end game, like that my, my, the positive outcomes of my life were like continually narrowing and that things, with, without making a substantial change, things were not really gonna turn out well for me at all. Um, that all came to a head. I had a friend um, who had a potential overdose at a party um, and I felt very responsible for that. He was eventually okay, but, but I definitely was not so. Um, you know, during that period, I, I was able to, to find something that I was, I was really sorely missing. And that was from Tom. Um, he brought um, mentorship into my life in a way that no one really had before. Um, so I think teachers can really change your life. And in my case, he definitely, I think, did save my life. Um, so I, I came to Tom and uh, the, the sort of, you know, best outcome I could see at that point. He always had a teaching assistant and there was always this, this person I kind of looked up to. And um, I was like, hey, you know, if I work super hard, could I be your TA someday? You know, that was literally like as far as I could sort of see ahead for myself. Um, and he saw me for my potential and not for my shortcomings. Um, he built something really meaningful with me, like a relationship unlike any adult outside of my own family ever had. Uh, he quickly gave me a lot of responsibility and forced exponential growth. He set really high expectations for me and would, would let me know if I, if I wasn't turning up on time or, or messing up. Um, you know, and, th and through those actions and just years of a relationship, like he really changed um, and I think probably did save my life. Um, when Tom got sick and, you know, a couple of years ago, um, we had in 2019, a bunch of uh, former students came together from all around the world to kind of rally around him. I think we used the excuse of trying to make some work to, to help him, you know, with some medical bills um, just so that we could hang out with him um, and make sure that he was okay and, and tell him how much he meant to us. So, you know, looking at this photo, you know, he's, he's, he's mentored some of us for decades. Um, and, you know, the impact that he's had, I think, you know, that, that speaks volumes for, for the potential of mentorship. Um, that's the reason why I started to be a teacher. And it's definitely the reason why I came back to Hastings. Um, so, Tom, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Um, cool. So uh, next I'm gonna talk a little bit about an artwork that I made in 1999. It's the only one that I'll talk about in any detail today. Um, and that's because out of everything I've made over the past 27 years, this one still means the most to me. So I used to live on 9th Street in this, this house that no longer is, exists. Um, it was like a one story house and there was a basement underneath. And uh, we lived on the, the first floor and, and this guy, his name is Slick. That, that's actually his name. Um, Slick and his family lived in the, in the basement underneath us and like, we just hear him like getting rowdy all night, like through the floor. And they were, they were like, they were an interesting crew of people. Um, you know, and he would come out and have cigarette breaks and we would just hang out and kind of talk sometimes. And, and he came across as this really rough old guy. He actually used to collect money for people, not like not in the legal sense. Um, and so he was a, he was a really hard guy. Um, and I kind of developed this idea of who I thought he was in my head. And, uh, you know, as, as you tend to do with people, unfortunately. And one day I was, you know, he, he came out there and I could tell that something was really wrong. And so I was like, Hey, like what's, what's going on? And it turns out that his wife was in the hospital. She had a, she was getting some skin grafts because she'd been burned really badly as a child. And like, as he was talking about his wife, and like what she'd gone through as a child and, and how much he loved her. Like it was like this whole kind of rough facade fell away. And I saw how incredibly loving this guy was and how, how much his wife meant to him. Um, so I kind of felt like I was seeing him and his essence for the first time. Um, around that time I'd start, you know, I was probably three or four years into using glass. I started using, like viewing it as this, this vehicle for expressing light and spirit and kind of like the unseen things in the world around us. And I'd already decided to, to do this project where I was gonna make these like life-size glass wings and have people standing in front of them and especially people that 
had exactly those qualities I saw in him that had this kind of like this exterior that made you feel a certain way, but you knew that inside of him there was this kind of humanity um, that really exists in each of us. So I approached uh, Slick and was like, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Are you interested in doing it? And I had to like really convince him he was not like down with it at all at first. Um, and he came to pick me up, you know, because I didn't have a car at the time. And he came to the door and he was like shaking, like he was nervous. Um, and so we sat in the, this is like in the old art department. So we sat in his, his like crappy old car and he was just chain smoking like, and he starts telling me all these stories and he'd like lost a son and he'd lost all these people in his life. And it was like, he, and I didn't ask him any leading questions to start learning this. It was like, he just started to kind of unfold. Um, and I saw all these things, um, you know, that I glimpsed earlier. So I, I titled it, uh, Sometimes When I Close My Eyes, I Can See Inside. So I was able to give him a, a large photo and the family put that in a, a real place of honor in their, in their home. Um, I submitted it to a, a glass magazine that, that judges the 100 most innovative works of the year internationally. Um, and as a 22 year old or something like that, I was able to get into that magazine with this image. So I was able, you know, I'd already left Hastings at that point, I was able to send copies of it to him. Um, and I know that it meant a ton to his family. So one day I was living in Omaha and I came home and um, I saw that there was a message, it was when they had like message machines. Um, and his, his daughter had called and as soon as I heard her voice, I kind of knew and she, you know, I called her back and um, she just said that she needed to talk to me. I called her back and she said that um, Slick had passed away. And uh, she, asked, she said, I have a few questions for you. And she asked, um, she said like, the, the photo you took of him meant a ton to him. Could we use it for the, uh, for the funeral announcement? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And then there was a pause and she said, um, we actually would really like to bury him with the photograph that you gave him, is, but we want to make sure that's okay with you. Is that okay? And um, I said, yes. And it was like in that moment, this kind of thing had come full circle, this thing that was a lot bigger um, than myself. And for me, it was, you know, um, any kind of, I, I think in some ways it redefined Slick to himself and his family. It, it showed them what I'd seen and what I was trying to convey with that artwork. Um, and I think it brought some small degree of like redemption to his life. And I think at the same time it brought some of the same to my own. Um, and that's really the standard that I've held the rest of my career to. Um, and I've never come close to, to doing that again, which is frustrating. But, um, you know, I, I think that there's a real potential of, of art making um, or really any active humanity that's, that's recognizing the good in someone else. Um, to go out into the world and, and really change things. Um, I think too that like we all, looking back at this whole period and my experiences personally and with Slick, like we all have the capacity to evolve and continually become our truest selves. And I think it's important that we're defined not by our lowest points, but by our highest potential. Um, so I'm realizing I'm running a little short on time, so I'm gonna start kind of cruising here. Um, so the next two decades were really defined by uh, working really hard and journeying out into the world. So after I graduated, um, I was really fortunate to, to get a position at the Joslin um, Museum in Omaha during the duration of a Chihuly exhibition. And this opportunity and so many others that I'll mention all come from kind of following these same three principles. Um, working hard, striving for excellence, and trying to be good to people generally. Um, you know, the first two are really easy, like I tend to, to work way too hard and I'm a total perfectionist, but always being good to people is like, that's, that's hard and that takes effort, right? So, but I really do think that doing those three things um, truthfully and authentically will separate you from, unfortunately, like a lot of the people out in the world. So for the next four months, I was able to, you know, um, demonstrate for tens of thousands of people in Omaha. And that was really the beginning of my professional career. Um, after that finished, I was able to move over to the hot shops in Omaha. Um, they were just trying, they were just starting the process of opening that up and preparing it for occupancy. So during the day, I would just do manual labor. I was like laying brick and floors and like painting studio spaces. And then I was blowing glass at night and on the weekends. So I was like working really hard just to move things forward. Um, I was able to have a, a workshop at the Corning Museum of Glass. And again, following those kind of same principles, that evolved into coming back as a TA. And then when I came back that last time, they offered me a job 
Um, and the job was not awesome. It was spending 40 hours a week making these ridiculous flowers. Um, and that was like 60 people a day and I literally like 40 hours a week I was like dreaming about making these things and it was it sucked but it was like I realized that, that not every initial opportunity is great but if it's going to open doors eventually it's absolutely worth doing that quickly evolved into doing a lot of other things teaching and de demonstrating narrating and assisting um, some of my peak learning experiences were here so this is one of the the greatest um, Italian masters ever to, to sculpt um, I was really, he's, he's passed away, but I was really fortunate to be able to study with him. Um, and I began building relationships uh, nationally and internationally, um, growing a community of friends and professional connections. I was able to start traveling to Italy and Scotland for workshops. Um, starting to make some work during this time. Again, like having departed organized religion, I was continually trying to like make sense of the world around me without that being the lens through which I, I could define or account for everything. Um, so eventually I became, I, I started splitting my time between Corning and Brockton, uh, Massachusetts at a studio. So I would, I was, I was teaching at MIT on Monday nights. They, they actually do have a glass blowing program that I wasn't teaching anything else. Um, in Brockton. So I was teaching Monday nights at MIT. I would work production Tuesday through Friday in Brockton. I would drive 400 miles back to Corning Friday night. I would teach there all weekend and then try to get back to MIT in time for class on Monday. Um, I did lose my license during that period because I was, I was speeding, trying to like get everywhere. <laughs> so I wound up spending a month in Corning like having to walk and it was one of the best things that could have happened. So I was like walking around thinking about a lot of stuff and I, I realized I've been putting a ton of energy like out into other people and I really needed to start investing in myself again and I needed to go back to grad school. Um, but I felt at that time like I'd matured enough to the point where it was like that actually really made sense. Um, I knew I could take one of two paths. I could either, um, oof, I could either go to a U.S. grad school or go to school internationally. Um, and so I chose to go for the unknown. How are we doing for time? Thirty minutes. Oh, cool. Great. Okay. Thank you. So in 2005, um, I moved to Canberra, Australia to study at the Australian National University. Um, I thought that I was going to be going for two years. I thought I'd finish my program, come right back to the States and kind of carry on. Um, but that was actually the beginning of 15 years overseas in this kind of personal and professional odyssey. Um, so, so this is the southern edge of Australia. Um, it's the edge of the country and the edge of a continent. When you stand on those cliffs, the, the next landmass over the horizon is literally Antarctica. So I felt like I'd really moved to the edge of the world. It's pretty, pretty profound to, to do that and feel that way. Um, when, I, when I moved to Australia, I knew one person, and I didn't think she liked me very much. Um, when I walked across the runway, you know, I had come from northern winter into like this blazing Australian summer. I just didn't know what was going on. We had this welcome barbecue that night, and I watched all my future friends and classmates chasing these huge spiders through the house, like cackling. And I was like, what have I done, you know? <laughs> um, and that's really, that, that sequence is something that happens to me all the time and I've come to really recognize that. So one of the most important lessons that I've learned started taking shape. And that was really that the fear of the unknown can never be a limiting or a determining factor. Um, you know, everyone I, I'd left felt incredibly far away. Um, fear of the un unknown loomed every single day. You know, and it would have been really easy for me to listen to that fear and be like, oh, this wasn't the right decision, I need to leave. And I would have lost so much. So now it's this familiar pattern. So I, I, I experience this kind of like doubt and fear. I understand that I just need to stay the course and that on the other side of that, I'm gonna feel profoundly thankful for it and my life will be so much richer for it. Um, so I stayed and I started to build a new life in Australia. So those first two years were centered around the rigor of grad school. Um, and my growth as an artist was really exponential. So um, this was the first work that I was making when I, when I got there. And this was what I was making two years later for my, my thesis exhibition. Um, this is kind of about the cycle of breath and, and meditation and all the cycles that we're immersed in as human beings. So my work matured really exponentially. Um, so during this time, the universe intervened for a second time. Um, I met my wife, Alana, at, at Pilchuck Glass School, and it's a long story, but I wasn't even supposed to be there. 
um, this opportunity kind of just fell into my lap. So my, my grandmother was this 97 year old Irish Catholic lady and she would sit at home and she would like pray for the family and she, her, her thing for me was like, let him find a good girl. <laughs> um, and I met Alana five hours after she died. So if that doesn't say something, I don't really know what does. Um, I can't really make sense of it any other way, but five months later, Alana moved to Australia and, and we've been together ever since. Um, during that time, so I was, I was meant to move back to the States. Um, it was 2008, so the, the GFC had just happened. Um, so it wasn't as viable financially to come back to America. And then um, coinciding with that, the, the Canberra Glassworks opened um, in the capital city. It was a $10 million renovation of an old power station. And I was able essentially to get in on the ground floor and I was the first artist to, to rent a studio space there. So it's a public glass making venue. Um, and I spent the next 10 years there as a studio artist, making work for other people, uh, teaching, making my own work, doing all kinds of different things to put together a career. Um, this is some of the work that I made during that time. Um, this was at the National Glass Collection. And this opportunity, and this, this is like the National Glass Collection of Australia, so it's kind of a big deal. The, the opportunity for that came walking out of a bathroom. I had done it, I'd been there demonstrating, I bumped into the guy that ran the gallery walking out of a bathroom. He was like, hey, what are you doing? I showed him some work and he's like, you should have a show with this. So like you never know and you never know like the, the connections that you're making. Um, so it was all a period of first. It was a really steep learning curve, and I felt like I was kind of figuring everything out as I went. And this is where um, another really important thing came out of that time, and it was consciously learning to be a beginner. Um, so I, I, you know, I was constantly navigating these cultural differences that were both subtle and substantial. And Australians were really quick to point out a shortcoming. So um, as a young American, they would call me out anytime I made a mistake and let me know. Um, but I was literally, I had to learn how to like cross the street again. I had to learn how to ride a bike, drive a car. Um, I had to learn, you know, to check my shoes for poisonous spiders. I had to, you know, navigate this thing called the tall poppy syndrome, which is still kind of impacts how I view myself and, and makes activities like this even more difficult. You should look it up. Um, I was also learning how to surf at the time and play mandolin, and I was, I was so inept at those things. It was in this, it really was in stark contrast to how, how I guess fluent I'd become with glass making. Um, but despite really sucking at that stuff, I really loved those new dimensions of life and kind of persisted. Um, I, th I think there's this trap that when anybody acquires a high level of skill or knowledge in a field, your ego or whatever it is kind of becomes addicted to the feelings that, that come along with that. And I think it's really easy to start consciously or unconsciously avoiding failure and, and stop being a beginner. Um, so for me, there's this like continual willingness to learn really enriched my life and it has made me a much more well-rounded and, and hopefully a humble person because I make a lot of mistakes. Um, during that time, a phone call kind of came out of the blue. Um, I'd taken a class with this guy, his name's Nick Mount um, in Corning and he was also really instrumental in helping me get into grad school. Um, and again, like those kind of three principles really paid off. Um, multiple times with that relationship with Nick. He called me and sort of with no, you know, lead in, he just said, do you want to go teach in South Korea? So in, in January of 2010, Alana and I moved to South Korea um, on a one-year teaching contract. 2010 was a really interesting time. Um, to be living there it was the first time that the South Korean mainland was bombed by North Korea. Um, they also sunk a naval ship during that time. So there were days when we had to keep our passports with us. Like our, our apartment would start to vibrate with these like huge squadrons of like Chinooks and Blackhawks flying overhead. It was, it was really fascinating and kind of scary some days. Um, so this was Namso University. Uh, at the time it had around 16,000 students um, and I was teaching the Department of Art and Environmental Design. Um, so there were some really good things about teaching in Korea. Um, I had some really good students. The food was really good. Um, but it, it also was not a good fit for me professionally and I didn't renew the contract. So we only stayed for a year. But some of the lessons that I learned in Korea have been some of the most lasting for me. So um, it was my first time being truly foreign. So I didn't speak the native language really at all. 
Um, I was immersed in a society and a working culture that I just didn't understand and frequently navigated uns unsuccessfully. Um, you know, I, I'd never been stared at before. I'd never been openly talked about, pointed at, laughed at. Um, you know, in this apartment building, when I'd turn a corner, people would kind of gasp because they weren't expecting to see this. Um, people, people thought that Alana was a Russian prostitute because, um, because she was one of the few like attractive foreign women around that apparently were not. Um, <clears throat> I was told that I look both like Brad Pitt and Justin Timberlake, which I clearly do not. Um, so that was kind of telling you how few foreign people they, they engaged with. Um, I was yelled at by more old men than I can count, and even had a, an old guy come up and start like handling my face while yelling at me. So there were days for me where not reacting physically to how I was treated made it a successful day. And that was, that was really tough. Um, I made this work during that time. It's, it's a figure that's encased in this, this sort of bell jar that's covered with this Korean text. And it was about being surrounded by like noise, because Korea is crazy. It was like noise and chaos. But I was kind of wrapped in this like cone of silence and separation. Um, <clears throat> you know, it was, it was really difficult. Like I felt alienated. I felt sometimes resented. <clears throat> often felt like a spectacle. Um, you know, and not, I, I learned what it's like to not be understood in basic conversation, like being hungry, not being able to order food, um, things like that. So it really changed, ultimately, like, I think how I perceive and relate to other people. Um, it definitely made me more compassionate, um, especially for people that don't speak the language that I speak. And I, I really actively seek means of communicating with people and understanding people versus judging their inability to communicate. Um, and I'm, I'm profoundly thankful for that time. Um, so we returned to Australia and continued working. And during that time, you know, collaboration became a really important part of, of my career. Um, you know, so I made work for lots of other friends. It was also a primary way of earning income. Um, this is Australia's premier didgeridoo player. His name is William Barton. I got to make him a, a didge. I was able to make the, uh, the Asia Pacific Screen Awards with, with a, a, a dear friend um, for 13 years. So she, would, she designed them and then engraved them, and I, I actually fabricated them. Um, and they were awarded to, for films in more than 70 countries and regions. Um, and they've gone all over the world. So during that period, I also felt like I was putting a lot of energy out, and that I needed this period of immersion, which for me, ironically, is you know, the best way to do that is in school. Um, so in 2012, I, I began a PhD in sculpture at the Australian National University. Um, and during that time, my, my focus of study was contemplative space in Japanese architecture. Um, I had taken a trip to Japan in 2003 that had really made an impact on me, and I, I wanted to spend time really immersed in that culture. Um, so, you know, that, that period of study is kind of a whole other discussion, but my work really evolved. Um, and then over the course of two research trips to, to visit different architectural sites, I became more and more immersed in Japanese culture and just really fell in love with it. So in Japan, there's a city, it's named Toyama. Um, and a lot of cities in Japan have a connection to craft historically. So um, Toyama is considered the glass city of Japan. Um, there's a school in Toyama, it's called Tiga. It's the Toyama Institute of Glass Art. And they, it's a two to four year school where the students focus solely on glass. They don't take anything else. It's just glass classes. It's, it's really quite incredible. And they have a rotating foreign faculty position. So every two to four years, new foreign teachers get to come in and that really fuels the program and the students with new influences and connections and all these things. Um, and I had applied previously. I think I'd applied two other times and I, I hadn't gotten it, but I'd sought feedback and I kept persisting. And on my third attempt, I was successful. So we were able to move to Japan in uh, 2017, 17, yeah, um, to Toyama. So Toyama is a, a city of nearly a half a million people. It's nestled in the Japanese Alps between, sort of between the Japanese Alps and the Sea of Japan. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's half a million people is a lot of people, but it feel, to me it felt like a really small town and it felt like a paradise. Um, I could surf 15 minutes away from our house. I could snowboard 45 minutes away. You know, I got to ride my bike through these like noshi pear fields overlooking the ocean on the way to work every day. Um, you know, our, our kids, we had two little kids at that point in time, so the, the kids were thrown straight into Japanese school. 
um, it, with no English spoken. And it was even our son's first time in school. Um, so, and he was not psyched here. So it wasn't always easy. <laughs> Um, but they persisted and they became pretty much fluent and made some great friends and it was really beautiful to see. So I mean those first months especially were a tremendous learning curve like any you know, sub significant move to a new country, but we really were thriving. Um, our ability to communicate was still limited, but I did speak more Japanese than I had Korean, which was helpful. But I just found the culture much easier to navigate. It felt kind of like coming back home and I'm not sure entirely why. Um, like while the, the trips I'd taken there and the research I'd done was helpful, it was more something about the way that people engaged with each other. There was this kind of like gentle restraint. You were able to retain your privacy. You weren't made a spectacle if you didn't look like everybody else. Um, even this beautiful gesture of bowing to each other, it's something, I, a habit that I still have and I, I don't really want to let go of. It's, it's like acknowledging the, the good and like the God in someone else and I think that's really beautiful. We should all start bowing. Um, so there's a real like love of nature there which resonates, a love of you know, beautiful things. Um, so we had all these wonderful memories and thinking about like a primary takeaway from Japan, it was actually really difficult because like so much good came out of it and so little that was really difficult. Um, we were just living fully. Um, I think ultimately our time was defined by exploration and embracing the unknown daily. So it was this constant going out into the world and experiencing the unknown and the richness of that. So we explored as a practice. Um, we spent copious amounts of time in nature, you know, in the oceans, mountains, waterfalls. Um, we ate tons of great food and we met wonderful people everywhere that we met, that we went. Um, and I think, when I think about that, I think that our ability to adventure so freely was kind of facilitated by this fundamental sense of safety, right? Um, there's this thing in Japan called wa, and it's, it's, it's the idea of social harmony and cohesion. And it, it can be taken to extremes that aren't healthy, but it, it sort of makes Japan what it is. Um, and in Japan, it's the, the deepest sense of safety I've ever felt. Um, I've had strangers walk me for blocks to a place that I couldn't find and then turn around and carry on with their day. Um, they had an equanimity, a kindness, and a generosity that really taught me volumes. Um, taught me about participation in community, um, putting the good of others on balance with my own. Um, I reflect on that frequently and I, I try to apply the lessons that I learned from those people um, in my work today at Hastings College. I also started, because of that safety and social well-being, I started consciously embracing discomfort. Um, so I started running in this bamboo forest behind school during lunchtime, and that led to, to participating in, in my first Spartan race in the mountains of Niigata. Um, and I've always been attracted to activities that kind of intensify the visceral experience of being alive. Um, being, you know, in communion with something beyond my scale or my scope. Um, and I encountered that growing up in the mountains or sitting, you know, on a surfboard in the ocean or meditating. Um, and at the beginning of our time, I started doing a lot of breath work and cold water exposure, which led me to doing this, this practice called, called takiyo, which is, it's a traditional purification ritual. And you wear this really thin robe and you get in this like, kind of back into this freezing mountain waterfall. Um, the first time I ever did it was, was New Year's Eve and it was, there was climb through snow on the ground barefoot and it was incredibly painful but invigorating. And it really, to me, like, marked a new chapter in my life. It was, it was transformative. Um, on our EXPL trip last year, um, Casey, Alana, and I were able to bring the students to the temple and uh, participate in that ritual ourselves. Um, and as one student recently shared, the waterfall was also a turning point in her life. So for me, like sharing Japan with our students last year was this incredible um, experience. And you know, it's, it's a place that I miss with my whole heart and I think about every day and that I'm profoundly grateful for having spent time in. Um, so soon after signing my third year contract in Toyama, um, Tom, Tom told me that he was, was sick. Um, and he's okay now, which is, which is great. I think he took off, but he's, he's healthy again, which is awesome. Um, he retired shortly after, um, but I saw that as an opportunity to give back. Like the, the impression that he'd made on my life was, was truly lasting and I wanted to pay that forward. So having, having seen the JDAC and learning about Jackson Dinsdale's story and meeting Kim and all these things, I decided to return. So in July of 2020, uh, we, we left uh, we're Japan, we left Japan 
and, and came back to Hastings. And it was this kind of full circle moment again. Um, I didn't think that I would, I would ever come back here, but here I am. And I, I hope that being here is, is somehow repaying all the things that I've been given. Um, so since being here, I've been able to really experience firsthand the tremendous good resulting from the combined power of community, collaboration, and voluntary hardship. So, um, so this is, where are we? Yep. So nearing the, the new year of 2022, Casey and I were, were talking in the gym one day after working out, and we were talking about this idea of masogi, which is kind of related to the waterfall ritual, but it's come to mean these days doing something once a year that's so difficult, it kind of defines the rest of your year. And this is something that was, was really appealing. Um, We've been talking about this, this event that David Goggins runs. He's a former SEAL and an ultra athlete where people run four miles every four hours for 48 hours. Um, and we're like, you know, what would it look like to run one mile an hour? Like, is, is that possible? Um, you know, and we're talking about this and then it was like, oh, well, well, maybe this could be an opportunity to create community um, rather than just kind of focusing on like our own brand of madness. Like, is there something we can do to build this into something more? Um, and then I was like, well, you know, is there like a way that it could become like a service or, you know, a service event? Could it raise money for something? Um, and when Casey said that, you know, there's a scholarship for his sister, Michaela, you know, things, you know, all the pieces kind of fell into place and uh, the Miles for Mick event was born. So with the cooperative, cooperative effort of key members of the campus community, um, that probably a 10, 15 minute conversation has gone on to raise nearly $30,000 for student athletes in only two years of, of running. Um, last spring, over 200 students walked, jogged, or ran at least one mile. Um, quite a few completed half or more. Um, and I, I feel like we really witnessed the best in students. Um, I've never been more proud or thankful to be part of this community um, and to see students out there doing, leaving parties, running drunk. Like it was, I don't encourage that, but, <laughs> but to see a kid like leave a party and go run a mile and then go back to a party and then come back an hour later is like, that's like, that's buy-in. That's incredible, right? Um, President Lloyd noted that it was one of the best examples of one campus, one community that he's ever seen. And I, I totally agree with that. Um, we're doing it again this year, so please come join us. It's not a race, and you can do it however you want to. Just come out for like one mile. Um, and I really think it'll show you a side to Hastings College that you, you might not have seen anywhere else. Um, so to me, the success of Miles for Mick um, demonstrates like the true power and potential of just a simple conversation um, founded in desire to evolve personally and create some greater good in the world. And, and to me, that's kind of like that sweet spot in human endeavor. I feel like we were really lucky and we kind of hit that moment and came up with something really special. Um, so combined with you know, members of the community, we've created something that brings people together in a meaningful and authentic way that opens our students' eyes to experience um, you know, intensive personal growth and, and the power to create change for good. So I kind of frequently think about how that generative collaborative process can be replicated um, and applied more broadly and more continually, um, both in my life and in all of our lives. You know, because if a glass blower and a human performance teacher can walk into a gym and create something from the seeds of a simple idea, like what else is possible? That's, that's really exciting to me. So in closing, I just want to make a few uh, supplications to you all. So if you're having a hard time, like seek help. There's no shame in asking for help, okay? If you're struggling with school, please talk with, with us, with your teachers and make a plan. Take advantage of Studio 200. Like I wish that had existed when I was a student in the form that it does now. If you feel like you're getting in too deep with like substances or whatever it might be for you, find a way out however you need to. Um, don't be afraid to change and don't be afraid to have that first hard conversation. Um, I really believe the transformation is not only possible, but I think it's something that we're tasked with as human beings. Um, seek mentors. They really make all the difference to your life. And when it's your time, be a mentor. I think it's one of the greatest acts of service that, that we can perform. Um, see the world up close. Like, leave behind the safety of your familiarity and intentionally put yourself outside of your comfort zone. You'll discover the most amazing places both out in the world and inside of yourself. 
And I think if everybody for a period of time lived somewhere where they don't speak the language, where they're the minority group, the world would be a totally different place. And if you're already doing this, I have the highest respect for you. Um, look for the opportunity to do good and to make an impact, to bring light to whatever degree that you can. I think it's one of the best parts of being alive. And the good that will come out of even the smallest action can never be underestimated. So in closing, I just want to thank you all for being here, for listening. I hope that this has been helpful in some way. Um, to, your, to the students, you make this job worthwhile, and it's really inspiring to see you out starting to live your lives. Um, to my colleagues, especially my colleagues in our department, um, thank you for your friendship and support. You're a really amazing group of people. Um, Casey, thank you so much for, uh, whoops. For, for introducing me today and for being here for the start of something really, really special. And then to Alana, thank you so much for creating this life with me. Thank you guys.